So, first of all, I would like to thank Professor Arukask. Thank you very much for the invitation and the Society for the Study of Religions, uh, the Estonian Society for the Study of Religion, uh, for the invitation for, to take these three lectures on Tantra and on the cult of the goddess Kamakya, uh, which are the opening visiting lectures on both on lectures in the study of religions. Then I have to thank uh, Dr. Indrak Pidu that is not here, but he was the architect of these lectures uh, when in 2020, during the European Association for the Study of Religion dinner in Pisa, he proposed the idea to organize a series of lectures uh, about Tantra in the University of Tartu. So after two years and after the COVID, I'm very happy to be here again because uh, I was here uh, in 2019 for the European Association for the Study of Religion Conference uh, when I organized uh, my first thematic panel on Tantra. And that was the first step that led me to build a network uh, of scholars involved in the study of Tantra. And finally, I would like to thank Professor Ulo Volk and the Department of uh, Religious Studies, uh, Religion and Theology of the University of Tartu. So just finally, I, I need to thanks the Italian Society of the History of Religion that always supported my research. So we can start uh, speaking about the roots of Tantra. Yeah. That is a very controversial issue uh, regards the birth of Tantra that is possibly a pre-tantric genealogy of non-Vedic elements such as magic, shamanic ones, the use of bones, skulls, blood, and sexual fluids in ritual praxis, spirit possession, shape-shifting shape powers, and so on. The fun fundamental question is whether Tantra belongs to non-Sanskritic, non-Brahmanic, and non-Indo-Aryan cultural strands that gradually influenced the Brahmanical elite, which is the heterogenetic paradigm, or is a development of Vedico-Brahmanic religiosity, which is the orthogenetic paradigm. Before I go on speaking about the orthogenetic against the heterogenetic hypothesis, I want to, step, I want to do a step back. Recently, in the British Museum, uh, in the British Museum website presenting the exhibition organized by Ima Ramos entitled Tantra Enlightenment to Revolution, Tantra is called a philosophy originated in medi medieval India. Reflecting on this sentence, the question that arose in my mind was, is it correct to use the term origin or should we use the plural origins when we discuss Tantra? The question is open and closely linked to the issue of Tantra uh, of Tantra's categorization. I'm inclined to support the idea of multiple origins of Tantra, considering its heterogeneous sectarian traditions, which developed across monsoon Asia. Indeed, there is no evidence to affirm a common origin of what we categorize as Tantra. Currently, there is no agreement on Tantra's roots and what Tantra was before its integration within the mainstream Brahmanic and non-Brahmanic religious theologies is still obscure. While some scholars claim Tantra is a mainly Brahmanic phenomenon, for example, Gavin Flood, which was successively appropriated by non-Brahmanic religious systems, it cannot be ignored that a number of ethno-indological studies have pointed out that a cross-cultural dialectic between Brahmanic and South Asian non-Vedic traditions stands at the origin of Tantra. The later involvement of heterodox Shaiva sects, uh, Shaiva sects in the formation of Tantric Buddhism is still dubious. Considering some pioneering studies such as Zimmer, in, 95, in 1953, Eliade in 1971, and Kinsley in 1998, the convergence between Tantra and the ecstatic cults has emerged. In, indeed, in this view, Tantra will be an affirmation of corporeal existence, which finds its roots in non-Vedic substrata, as well as in the indigenous worship of mother goddesses across South Asia. 
Samuel, in 2008, terms these traditions proto-Shakta, in order to describe religions and ideologies which were already part of the South Asian cultural identity. Even before uh, 1,500 years before Common Era, era when contacts between the inhabitants of, of, it, of the Indian subcontinent with the Indo-Aryan speaking groups began. I want to underline that I'm speaking of contacts and not at all of invasion, because as Edwin Bryant in 2001 pointed out, the Aryan invasion theory is at best a linguistic issue. We have no evidence of any military conflict between Aryan-speaking groups and South Asian indigenous people. After this cultural encounter, it is difficult to point out which religious and cultural patterns belong to the Indo-Aryan speaking culture, and which to the indigenous traditions of South Asia. Unfortunately, there is also an essential lack of information regarding the non-Vedic Indo-Aryan speaking groups, which could either clarify or miss up the issue of the roots of Tantra. What is known is, is that around the middle of the 6th century, the concept of Shakti arose around 2,000 years later than the encounter between Indo-Aryans and South Asian indigenous people in the northwest of the Indian subcontinent. What happened during those two millennia is not known. Although a proto-Shakti, to adopt Samuel's terminology, is already present in the Vedic corpus, in fact, the gods cannot trigger the cosmogony without any participation of the goddess. The Shakti pervades not only the cosmos, but also the social order. Hence, when the devotees, through the ritual praxis, break the intention between purity and purity, they are breaking the order of the Vedic universe. In this way, practitioners are able to unleash the Shakti, a supra-social and superhuman power, or an energy related to feminine. Where, when, and how this theology was introduced within the, the Vedic theology is unknown. There is indeed no indisputable evidence to prove that it was stimulated by the encounter with the indigenous people of the Indian subcontinent. Therefore, due to, due to the lack of material evidence, it is strenuously debated whether the use, to use again Samuel's words, the first goddess practices have their roots in a Shakta or at least proto-Shakta tradition, which was gradually incorporated into Shaiva and Buddhist, and Buddhist practice, or whether they result from an essential orthogenetic development out of the Vedic material. Christian Wedemeyer from the University of Chicago uh, considered those who try to understand the relationship between Tantra and otherness, a term that describes the cultures at the margins of Barakmanism to be retrograde and not serious scholars. According to Wedemeyer, the notions of Tantrism as a primordial tradition of matriarchal mother worship magic and sex rites or as representing a perennial pre-Aryan religion of India, are largely defunct. On the other hand, more historically and anthropo anthropologically, savvy writers continue to maintain that these rites and traditions must have come from similarly primitive tribal communities in India. This view consequently continues to attract considerable attention and assent in the contemporary scholarly accounts. Wedemeyer clearly supports an orthogenetic genesis of Tantra and criticizes any, any hypothesis of tribal or indigenous interference in the origin of Tantra. However, while Wedemeyer's argument regarding the lack of material evidence to link South Asian tribe of the first millennium common era with Tantra's origins is indisputable, there is also no evidence to relate the birth of Tantra to the Vedic milieu. The problem is that Wedemeyer does not provide any alternative. He is right regarding the fact that in the past, indigenous people was, were naively depicted as bearers of, of a timeless, primordial, and prim primitive culture, 
Nevertheless, it seems likely that some indigenous cultures not only were, were resilient to the influence of mainstream Indic traditions, but they also could have in, influenced the appropriation of transgressive, liminal, and dangerous practices by the Sanskritic elite. Each of these approaches to the issue seem to have its disadvantages. The first approach lacks any proof or non-affiliation to specific institutionalized lineages. The second one is based on the identification of some transgressive practices preserved in the Vedas, although it seems to be not enough to trace a continuity between these and later developments. On the contrary, these Vedic inconsistencies could be used by mainstream religions to legitimize transgressive practices. Indological academia seems to be divided into two factions. On the one side, textual scholars who base their studies mainly on philological methods, and on the other side, scholars who base their studies on, the method on other methodologies, sometimes failing to consider the written sources related to their research. My, perspe my perspective coincides with the need to place on the same level textual studies and other disciplines, such as art history, archaeology, history, religious studies, and ethnography, in order to have co a comprehensive perspective of Tantra as a social religious phenomenon. So, what is Tantra? is one of the most discussed and unsolved questions in the field of Indology and Asian religions. I selected a couple of definitions, which, however, are not at all exhaustive. According to André Padou, as a category, tantrism, tantrism is not, or at, at any rate was not until our days, an entity in the minds of those insides. It is a category in the minds of observers from outside. To use a fashionable jargon of today, it is an ethic, not an emic entity. While according to Hugh Urban, Tantra is a far messier product of the mirroring and misrepresentation at work between both East and West. It is a dialectic category born out of the mirroring and mimesis that goes on between Western and Indian minds. Neither simply the result of an indigenous evolution nor a mere orientalist fabrication, Tantra is a shifting amalgam of fantasies, fears, and wish fulfillments, at once native and other, which strikes to the earth of our construction of the exotic Orient and of the contemporary West. These definitions, although quite different between them, are far from the colonial description of Tantra, which was described as the most horrifying and degenerate aspect of the Indian mind. This is absolutely negative reading of Tantra was probably influenced by Christian belief of British colonizers. Therefore, Tantra was understood as India's darkest and most irrational element. Luckily, in the recent decades, academic interest in Tantra has been increasing, so that several scholars try to find a comprehensive definition able to describe Tantra. The term Tantra, which I use as synonym of Tantrism, is a heterogeneous and multiple religious and sociocultural phenomenon that throughout the centuries was appropriated by and adapted to the Indic mainstream religions inside and outside South Asia. Following Andrea Acri's insights, Tantra indeed transcended the boundaries of, Indian of the Indian subcontinent and spread over what is called Monsoon Asia, playing a pivotal role in the religion of the geographic areas which were labeled in the past as peripheries of the Indic world such as Central Asia, Nepal, Tibet, mainland and maritime Southeast Asia and Southern China. In its early history, the term Tantra shows an evolution. It appeared in the Vedas 
around 1,500 and 1,000 years before Common Era. And in that context, uh, it means warp or loom. According to several etymological interpretations, uh, the Vedic term Tantra seems related to, what, to the order of the phenomenal world. In the later Brahmanas, around 1,200 and 900 years before Common Era, Tantra took on the far more abstract meaning of essential part of framework. Whereas in the Mahabharata, around 500 be years before Common Era and 500 Common Era, uh, it meant a doctrine or scientific work. Finally, in the 7th century, Kadambari of Banabatta, the term Tantra describes a collection of manuscripts written on palm leaves. In her magistral publication on Chim Namasta, Elizabeth Bernard reported a fasc fascinating and emic explanation of Tantra using a form of etymology. Many contemporary ascetics define Tantra as action done with the body for the purpose of protecti protecting or bringing about release. One etymology of Tantra divides the word into two roots, tan to stretch or to expand, and tra to save or to protect. By combining these two roots, Tantra means the increase of methods available in order to liberate oneself from the cycle of existence. Hence, what is today defined as Tantra is, no, is a non-univocal religious phenomenon, which since the middle of the first millennium common era, spread out from South Asia to Central, East, and Southeast Asia, affecting both Brahmanical and non-Brahmanical religious systems. There have been many attempts to classify Tantra in order to better understand and explain this heterogeneous phenomenon. Among these attempts, Gupta, Gaudrian, and Hons affirm that Tantra stands for a collection of practices and symbols of ritualistic, sometimes magical character, such as mantra, yantra, chakra, mudra, nyasa, etc., applied as means of reaching spiritual emancipation from or the realization of mundane aims chiefly domination in various sects of Hinduism and Buddhism. They enumerate 18 characteristics of Tantra that I will summarize. So first, Tantra offers an alternative and practical individual road to salvation beside the Vedic one. Tantra recognizes and expounds mundane aims besides spiritual emancipation or final release. It teaches the practice of a special variety of yoga destined to transform the animal instincts and function by creating an upward movement in the body along the chakras. Connected with this yoga is the elaboration of a mystic physiology in which the microcosm of the body is identified and homologized with the macrocosm of the universe and the world of the gods. Mystic nature of speech and this, its constituents. Use of generally short and intelligible formulas such as mantras and bijas. Use of devices like intricate formulas and geometrical designs such as mandalas, yantras and chakras. Realization of supernatural world by specific methods of meditation involving in the first place the creation of mental images of deities who may be worshipped internally. Ambivalence of divine and human existence, the divine and the demoniac, as also the erotic and the destructive, are considered to be complementary aspects of the same awesome invisible reality. The importance of female manifestation, manifestations called shaktis. The practice of realizing the double side of nature of existence by an intentional regulated contact with the socially disapproved persons or entities, such as meat, wine, locust women, or bodily excretions. Emphasis upon the absolute necessity of initiation by a qualified guru 
who is commonly identified with the chief deity. The development of a complete set of ritual practices beside the traditional Veda-oriented one. A far, uh, a far fitted categorization of reality, especially in the symbolism of numbers and, and of speech. Further elaboration of speculations common in Brahmanism. Thus, the Kaular Navatantra distinguished 10 manifestations of Brahman as against the usual number of five. A connection of yoga mentioned under point three with the very old alchemical practices of Siddhas and the body culture of the Atha Yogins. The existence of a special religious geography by the cultivation of places of pilgrimage of its own, such as the Shakti Pitas network. And finally, the use of special set of terminology or even of code language, both of them requiring particular methods of exegesis, which were originally meant to be added overall only orally by the guru. However, the tantric milieu is so heterogeneous that not only its sects share this, these characteristics. Brooks, in 1990, 1990, following a brainstorming session that took place at one of the earliest conferences of the Society for Tantric, Tantric Studies in Flagstaff in 1998, during which 25 sorry, 1988, during which 25 characteristics were identified, uses a, a polythetic classification in order to define Tantra. So there is no a priori justification for, uh, for deciding that any single characteristic is, is the most definitive. Brooks identifies 10 main characteristics that, are, uh, that Tantra may have, but that may also be shared by non-Tantric sects, which combine theoretical and intellectual concepts with practical ritual formulation and prescriptions. Among these, apart from its connection to yogic practices and, cosmo and cosmophysiology, he underlines an extra Vedic character of Tantra. This concept allows Tantra to be considered as a, an anti-Vedic phenomenon which does not reject Vedic and Hindu exoteric corpora and practices, but that subordinates them either as separate or inferior forms of sadhana. The identification of, of the elements which contribute to identifying Tantra is still extremely problematic because of their fluidity. Within the constructed category of Tantra, according to André Padou, Tantrism is a protean phenomenon so complex and elusive that it is practically impossible to define it or at least to agree on its definition. However, in the last three decades, many studies have converged on the idea that there is a relationship between Tantra and Shakti, encompassing the divine and the political categories. Orzic considers Tantra as a tool to spread religious and political ideas, while David Gordon White describes Tantra as a body of beliefs and practices which are needed to manipulate the divine energy manifested in the concrete universe. Both these ideas seem to have been developed by Ronald Davidson, who links Tantra with kinship and power, and by Hugh Urban, for whom Tantra centers around the release, optimization, and harnessing of power. The medieval South Asian kings, even if they belonged to the Sanskritic elite or were Hinduism indigenous chiefs, operated as cross-cultural mediators in several religious and historical background. They subverted the Vedic ritual prescription and harnessed the pol polluting forces produced throughout the ritual uses of anti-Vedic substances, such as blood and sexual fluid, thus strengthening their political power. Therefore, bodily fluids acted as magical instruments the king, through blood offerings, as any sadaka, was able to reach the even, while, as a ruler, he was able to defeat the enemies. 
and to maintain the stability within the kingdom. As we can read in the early medieval Kalika Purana, it is through offering sacrifices that devotee obtains liberation from the bondage of the world. The even and prince gets victory by conquering his enemies. These kings, having been done the army, the kingdom, and the treasure, increase if these sacrifices are not performed, famine and mass death occur, and, in the, six, and, and the six kinds of danger take place. Therefore, particularly, this should be performed. Kings became impure only for a moment when it, it is required to deliver judgment, perform preliminary rites of sacrifice, and invade the enemy kingdom. This part is a, the tantric part of the Kalika Purana that is a, a fundamental tantric test inside the Puranic uh, tradition of Northeastern India. So to model things even further, uh, any attempt to define Tantra is messed up by the, by the sub-classification of its sects into left-hand Tantra, Vamachara, and right-hand Tantra, Dakshinachara. Left-hand practices are those related to sexual and other transgressive performances, while right-hand practices grew out from the left-hand prob probably to institutionalize Tantra. David Gordon White in 2003 has proposed another binary classification into hardcore and softcore Tantra. Hardcore Tantra is a more exclusive category that is composed by those elements of Tantric doctrine and practice that are not found in other Asian religions. Softcore Tantra, uh, on the other hand, is a more inclusive category, whose doctrine and practices are found in almost all Asian religions since the Vedas. Softcore Tantra sanitized those ritual, rituals perfor performances, which were considered dangerous and contaminating for the practitioners. Hence, in what is described as softcore impure substances, such as flesh, blood, urine, uh, feces, sperm, women's sexual fluids, are replaced with vegetable ones. On the other hand, our core tantra includes sexual rights which are not found in any other Asian religion. The sexual rights are the translation into sexual terms of ritual decapitation and hence an, an, an exaltation of the combining symbolism of sex and death. However, during a personal communication with David Gordon White, he told me that he is now inclined to abandon, abandon his hardcore of core terminology in favor of Olga Sarajevic's division in Ata Melaka and Priya Melaka. Melaka is a special term denoting all kinds of encounters with yoginis, who are a group of, feminine, of female terrifying deities. Sarawaji, studying the Vidya Pita text, points out a different classification of tantric rituals. In the Vidya Pita text, neither Ata Melaka nor Priya Melaka is univocally described. The Ata Melaka is variously linked to the violence of blood sacrifices and consumption of human blood and flesh. On the other hand, the potential sexual character of Priya Melaka is neither, neither connected nor contradicted by the Vidya Pita text. What Sarawaji highlights is the supernatural and dangerous nature of the yoginis, although some Vidya Pita texts suggest that yoginis could be also be born as human women. Nevertheless, sexual fluids seem to have been an important offering to call the yoginis before the Tantrika but usually they were obtained through sexual intercourse with a duty, that is a consort. Or could be also a prostitute, but it depends from the textual source that you take into consideration. I would like just add few information regarding the Yoginese. Unfortunately, Yoginese history uh, in pre-tantric tradition is built on speculations 
that originated from the analysis of esoteric Buddhist Vidyapita and Kaula text. We have no idea of how the yoginis were integrated not only into the tantric traditions, but also in the folk religiosity of the village mothers who were considered foreign mothers of the yoginis, and the matriganas and their later development around the middle of the, or the end of the sixth century into the Saptamatris cluster. Narendranath Bhattacharya suggested that the yoginis was were priestesses who were supposed to be possessed by the goddess, a fact that would explain why the Kaula Tantric text intersected the imaginary of human and divine yoginis. In fact, this text not only preserves a religious tradition related to copulation with and blood offering to yoginis, but also a tradition of yoginis as preceptors and teachers belonging to ascetic orders. Coming back to the sectarian division of Tantra, to sum up, defining Tantra exclusively on one of these classifications seemed to be a fluid attempt, particularly in the case of Vamachara religious landscape. Coming back to Padu observations, perhaps it is necessary not only to consider Tantra through texts and rituals, but to remove our scholar lens and consider far more the practitioner's view of Tantra, something that could drive Tantra either toward or away from what may be described as mainstream, and any psychological implication due to the force and counter of monsoon Asia societies with the British colonizers. By adopting a polythetic classification, what may be called Sanskritic elitist Tantra, which is mainly based on, on textual sources, influenced vernacular non-Sanskritic traditions. On the other hand, elitist textual tantra was penetrated by vernacular or popular practices. While some scholars restricted tantra to Sanskritic sources related to the initiation lineages, other scholars take into consideration also traditions outside the Sanskritic culture of the mainstream Indic religious world that are mainly Hinduism and Buddhism. To quote Andrea Acri, Tantra in the past decades has been studied as a top-down, elite-driven phenomenon that is very much part of the Sanskritic and or Brahmanical intellectual and textual tradition. Tantra confronts us with the paradox that from the moment it bursts into the Indic religious cosmos, its ritual system has emerged as a source of incommensurable yet dangerous power, which often was consciously formulated in violation and subversion of mainstream norms, brahmanical or otherwise. Indeed, Tantra can be associated not only with the religious and political elites that sponsored it, there be facilitating its spread, but also with marginal ethnic groups and social milieu, as well as with lay communities at large who resorted the ritual agents, both institutionalized or not institutionalized, to fulfill their worldly needs. Tantra, indeed, is often associated to, uh, in monsoon Asian context to low caste people and tribal groups, highlighting a superimposition between Brahmanic and magic shamanic tribes. In fact, Tantra intersects, stratifies and overlaps liminal, transgressive and dangerous practices, showing a dialectic between the margins, which are folk and tribal traditions, and, then, and the Sanskritic elite. Tantra clearly shows an intersection of several religious and cultural strands. It seems either antithetical or complementary to Indic mainstream ideologies and praxis. The fact that Tantra is also characterized by non-Vedic praxis or praxis that intersect the Brahmanic religiosity is a controversial aspect. Indeed, the cross-cultural dialectic stands behind the incorporation of marginal and liminal elements in Tantric praxis, 
these elements were appropriated by Brahmanism and Buddhism over a relatively long period, although it is often difficult to establish the direction of influences and how the Sanskritic tantric milieus codified vernacular and indigenous elements. These practices show similarities with those usually and vaguely labelled as magic shamanic, shamanic or tribal religions of non-Sanskritic ethnic group of Monsoon Asia, evoking a mutual cross-pollination between institutionalized Sanskritic elitist religiosity and the folk or, relig or indigenous tradition. So I would like to close the lecture uh, quoting my PhD ex-supervisor, Raffaele Torella, uh, I will translate from Italian, who says that tantrism represents, on the other hand, a named answer to the Brahmanical world as much great as the challenge that triggered it, having the same great final goals. The fight back happened on the pivotal religious not discussing the legitimacy as well as the consistence of the dual division between pure and impure, a division addressed meanwhile to have been crumbled, being pushed by an intentional non-dual behavior in which it must be looked for the authentic part of the tantric translation. Thank you. So, if, if, if I have some, some more time, I would like to show some, okay, yeah, some picture of uh, a living tantric tradition because, uh, so this one is uh, more based on textual studies and uh, of course on the secondary literature and on the thinking of the scholars that are approaching tantric studies, but I think even from what is my perspective on Tantra is I would like to show you some, a, tantric, a living Tantric tradition that is the tradition in Kamakya that is uh, one of the most important Tantric uh, uh, temple in uh, South Asia because uh, it is believed that there the Yoni of Sati fell down. Uh, the Yoni is, uh, is the vulva of the goddess. Uh, it is preserved inside the Garbagriya that you can see is the, this one is the main building. Uh, the entrance is on the other side, that is the east side. I when I got this picture, I was on the west side because it's the only part of the temple from which you can almost take all the structure. Uh, so the yoni is preserved in the dark room that you can see is uh, under the ground. And uh, the temple is uh, always stolen every day. Of course, the main festival is the Anubashimela uh, during the rainy season in June or July. But uh, during the Anubashimela, there are around uh, one or two thousand, uh, one or two hundred thousand people. So it's really crowded. During a normal day, uh, if you want to have the, the temple open <coughs> Sure about. Uh, but if you want to have like a uh, puja inside the sanctum around 10 o'clock, uh, it's better if you arrive to the temple at 4 o'clock in the night, unless you, you have to wait maybe in the middle of 12 o'clock, something like this. So, this picture that can look maybe a strange picture because there is a book and someone say, but why are you show sure us? Uh, uh, so that picture with a goat and not just a wonderful picture of this menstruating goddess. She is a menstruating goddess, we don't know. Most of the scholars involved in uh, Kamakya studies say that, is, uh, that she is a um, uh, Lajadori. I'm not so sure that she is a Lajadori, so I never wrote that she is Lajadori in my publications. In my idea, she is not Lajadori, but she could be a representation of the goddess. No one knows, so we are in the field of hypothesis. The goat is there because uh, I would like to understand that 
the Ellie Hudson, the Terrain, Kamaja, can take the roles, the obviously a male roles, not a female roles. Um, you can take it, you don't have to pay nothing, you go to the uh, circuit, uh, sacrificial uh, hall and you can sacrifice, uh, giving an offer to the police, <coughs> sacrifice for you the gold. You cannot directly sacrifice the gold, but you have to ask the priest to do this. This one is always on the uh, in the um, Kamakya complex, it's outside the main complex, but it is a Shiva temple. Again, I show this picture because I would like the people to understand that the tantric and Shiva tantric, uh, not just the Shakta tantric traditions, are living traditions. The people use the temple to play, doing parties, and whatever. Kind of so, in this picture, if I remember well, they were playing football, but I'm not so sure, I don't remember well because it's a, a picture of 2016. This one is a view of the road to arrive to the main temple. Yet, on the left side of the second picture, you can see the Kali temple. Because uh, the Mila Shala, which is the Kamasha temple, is the only place where you can find uh, um, a prayer shrine for Abhimabhi, that is a group of ten goddesses. Tantric uh, goddesses, but from Kingsley uh, publication that he wrote a monograph on Mavidias, it seems that Kamaki is the only place where there are private shrines of uh, Mavidias. So every Mavidias has uh, its private shrine. But I'm not sure if I was dealing with you or with someone who told me that there are other. Uh, other, other Shaktipitas in India where there are private shrines for fellow uh, of Marias. So this one is a uh, Ganesha, obviously. It's completely red, they depict it uh, red because uh, it's a Shakta temple. If we are back in the main temple of Kamakya. Uh, every people that arrive in Kamakya, even if it's a uh, old sheep, uh, Shaka, Shaila, or Vaishnava, or whatever, the first thing, the first puja is for Vishnu, always. Uh, there are some coins uh, uh, that people put there. It's, a, it's an offer. So. I think that this one summarizes very well what is Kamatya for, uh, for the Believers. She is a mother, and this one is a mother that she is feeding this baby. Even she, if she is a terrifying mother, but no one considers the terrifying form of Kamatya. It's dangerous, but uh, no, no one uh, is going to say, no, Kamatya is just a good mother. She is a mother that can be a good mother, but she can be a very terrifying mother. The other one should be, um, I'm not sure because there is no identification, I'm just an hypothesis, but I think he is doing some Diana performance, but I'm really not sure about. This one is uh, Matangi. Uh, the old woman, she's the basis. <laughs> she didn't want a direct picture, so she told me that I can take pictures, but she didn't want a direct picture. And I respect this always when I do field work, I never take pictures without asking. Or, uh, there are some scholars that do this. But I and it was, this one is a, a better view of Madame Gilda. I don't know for me, look, it, she looks very fine as well. That's, uh, she's one of the Madigidias. Uh, and uh, she's a uh, uh, worship inside the main complex of the market. And these are the yogis uh, about whom I spoke uh, during my lectures. Uh, so the first two pictures were identified as uh, yoginis by Yogi Urban and 
in this book, publication. I'm not sure if he already in 2001 or just in 2009, but doesn't matter too much. Uh, they didn't look so terrifying, I suppose. I'm not sure, but in my idea they didn't look so terrifying. But they are. And the last one, I suppose that she's another UB. Uh, she is uh, in the complex of Kamatia. You but never, never organized very well the archaeological part of his work, so I'm not sure which representation are UBEs for him or which are not. In my idea, the last one is quite similar to, to the others. And even these that I find uh, near um, an, a temple that is, uh, if I remember well, uh, on the north, northern side of the uh, Kamakya temple, uh, I suppose they are really easy, they are quite similar to the ones that you do and identify. There's one, these one are around the main sanctum. Uh, I count them, I don't remember very well the number, but usually in the Kawa tradition, the Yuginis should be 64. They are not 64. I try to make some calculation uh, based on the fact that the uh, western part of the sanctum is not, uh, it's not possible to see because they built over another new part of the temple, so maybe there were other representation of the Yoginis, but even counting that one that I is advisable to me, uh, we cannot arrive to 64. So the number is quite strange. They are uh, a late medieval production, probably of the Amon family, that was a tribal family that got the power in Kamarupa. The ancient Assam. We don't know very well, but for sure that they are Yuginese. All the priests of the temple believe that they are Yuginese. The, the devotees don't know very well. They are not sure about. Someone think that they are Yuginese, someone have no idea. I think they are, because the one on the right side is extremely dangerous in its aspect. And there are two or three like this. These are maybe if someone uh, reads something about Kamakya, this one uh, is one of the two Chinasta, more, the more famous Chinasta, maybe in South Asia actually, because uh, there is a cover of a famous book of Yuban, not with this one, but with this other one. And, uh, they were removed, unfortunately, and uh, they are not in the original, original place. So we don't know very well from where they got the, these two sculptures. Uh, for sure, they belong to the 11th or 12th century. They are, for sure, from the iconographic analysis, they are China stars, both. Uh, you can see here there is a corpse under the, the feet of Chinasta, and uh, she has the knife, uh, and she is, I, I suppose, extremely very fine, but I don't know. In my idea, she is. And here again, some statue that this one should be a restaurant behind the, behind the sculpture on the right. It should be a restaurant, they just got the sculpture and place everywhere around the Little Shala Hill. So we have a lot of problems. If you are uh, an archaeologist, uh, you will have a lot of problems to date the, the sculpture because they are decontested always. And it's a great problem in South Asia. This is the entering of the sacrificial hall inside the main. Uh, the main temple, you can see behind the grave that there, are, there is a crew of people inside, they are waiting to go to the sanctum and they are still far away from the sanctum. And it's quite dangerous because you are close inside that grave. If you do normal puja like 
normal people here and you don't want to spend like 10 euros uh, like all Europeans and North Americans and you do the good job with the devotees, you have to do that one. That is, I have done my own, my talk always that it's quite dangerous because if something happens, you can go outside. So it's, maybe it's better to spend the ten euros, but it's less than ten euros. The problem for me was not the money, obviously, but I want to do the things that do the devotees. This one is behind the sacrificial hole. The sacrificial pole, obviously. Every day they, they can sacrifice, you know, around uh, 12, it depends from day and day, 12, 20 uh, uh, eagles. Uh, during the, during the, uh, the, during the weekend, it's possible that someone, usually people that are going to marry, uh, sacrifice a buffalo, uh, but it's quite costly to make a buffalo sacrifice. The PS can ask you some money more, and you have to buy the buffalo. You cannot take a free buffalo because it's, it's not allowed. Uh, I have seen, unfortunately, uh, last uh, winter, thieves entering my house and stealing my laptop with all my. So unfortunately, I lost a lot of teachers, and I cannot. I was unable to find in, um, in my cloud uh, a picture two kind of buffaloes just to understand what's going to happen. If you don't have money, you can buy a very very old buffalo. I have seen a buffalo completely white, and it was white because it was very old, not just because a genetic problem. So they spend less money, but they can sacrifice a buffalo. Unless if you if you are able to pay, you can sacrifice a normal buffalo. There, there are some problems on the identification of the on the taxon of the buffaloes. In my idea they were uh, water buffaloes. Reading some articles and speaking with the either Newton and Francesco Briganti, uh, the Briganti is extremely expert about buffalo sacrifice. It could not be a uh, water, it should not be a uh, water buffalo, but a very young. However, I will speak uh, in the third lecture about the buffalo a bit more. This was a uh, goat waiting to be sacrificed. That one is a bit violent picture, so it's so they sacrifice animal and it's a Hindu temple. Actually, it is an Hindu temple. Hindu temple, but it's Hindu. Okay, <coughs> and this one. So, uh, in the middle, you can see a shakta piece. It's completely red. His uh, uh, clothes are completely red. Uh, on the left side, in my idea, you can see something extremely strange. A woman, a woman and she's a priest, and she's a child. Indeed, she has nothing uh, red in his clothes because she's a child. And in the right side, you can see when I was making a few words, sorry, but I want to remember. He was a Shakta priest. Uh, I spent a bit of time with him, and he was an astrologist. He was not from Assam, he was from um, Uttar Pradesh, so from northern central India, more or less. This one, uh, you cannot take picture inside the temple, okay? Is the, all the temples uh, around Kamadi are uh, new. They are not belonging to medieval period. This one is a Dumavati temple, and uh, the person on the, the priest on the right side is the main priest of the Dumavati temple. It allowed me to take a picture like this. I even asked for a special. So, and here, uh, the last, almost, there is one more. I don't know if we have time. Yes. 
Yes, you do. I think that is very interesting, the picture on the left side. Because it is, uh, I don't know, she is a female goddess. And she is a non-anthropomorphic goddess at all. But they uh, have uh, a couple of eggs. So now she is a goddess, she is Makai. Even on the right side, she is Makai. She is inside. I'm not sure that I can take this picture, but no one told me that I cannot. There was no one inside and outside. So this one is a cannabis uh, field. Uh, I, it is the temple of the most important cannabis field in Romania. There are four cannabis. Uh, this one is the most important, and probably it is the one that is mentioned in the Kali Purana. Uh, so, in the medieval period, it was uh, uh, the main uh, deity of this category was Eruta, that is a male god. Uh, a male god. Actually, it's a goddess, and I suppose that there was a bit of confusion. Uh, in the sexual, uh, <coughs> the stomach is a place where sexuality is uh, extremely fluid. So it's science middle libra. Uh, there was a confusion from um, either from the people that wrote the Chinese text, <coughs> probably. But we are in the speculation. Uh, Field, uh, and uh, I will speak about this, I don't remember it tomorrow, the event. But the important thing is that she's anthropomorphic, uh, and uh, this one is extremely Hindu Shakta and Tatic side. And they use an, a non anthropomorphic uh, form to represent Kali or a form of Kali. And no one cares about the Kanaki as a place extremely open to Hindu, non Hindu, European, non European, they really don't care about. Uh, you can go in every temple, you can enter in every, in every something, something that if someone is being in, in a Tamil Nadu, know that you cannot let, not enter in some in Santa because you are not Hindu, so you are not allowed. In Kamakia, you can enter everywhere, and in Assam as well, you can enter everywhere. In Maria, the fact that this one is uh, non anthropomorphic is clearly uh, an intersection between uh, Brahmanism and indigenous beliefs. Uh, during the Abuashimila, up to a few years ago, because now something is changed by the politics, so. Uh, Naga people, they mm, Naga people that arrived in a Kamakia for the Amuashimila seems that are not anymore allowed to enter the temple, but I'm not so sure about it. I read it on the newspapers, uh, Assamese uh, newspapers. I tried to ask to some people that have been uh, in Kamakia recently, recently, and they told me that they cannot anymore enter the temple, but they are not sure as well because they were not doing the Amuashimila. Usually, they come during the Amuashimila. Now, the people are uh, a population of Northeastern India. They are a tribe of, a tribe of Northeastern India. And, uh, but they worship Kamakis, someone worship Kamakis, but well, obviously not to the other people. And this one, I'm sorry because it's the last one. I cannot show you a <coughs> more picture of this one because uh, Bada came to the temple because uh, it was stolen and uh, I hope to find uh, a way to recover because I have an old laptop that is not that more working. In this side that is 40 kilometers north of uh, Gowaki, so Kamaki is next to Gowaki, there are a lot of uh, uh, sculpture of sexual act, really a lot, uh, almost like in the Chan famous Chandela's temple in Madhya Pradesh. Uh, they are not studied at all, no one cares. Uh, 
everything is messed up. It's, it's not possible to make an archaeological survey because they got um, rocks from uh, like the seven or eight temples and they, and they construct a new temple uh, just between the squares uh, all around and uh, they are completely decentralized. And that's all. Yeah. And if you need somebody other philosophers, you can give you from it. These are just the few of the references that if someone who wants to start to understand what is Tantra is can be interesting. Uh, they are not really the they are not really on studies on Tantra, but they are Newer studies, uh, obviously, I selected just books, but there are a lot of articles that you can read. Uh, particularly, the power of Tantra is on uh, Assamese Tantra. And, uh, and that's all. Thank you. Many thanks for this uh, wonderful lecture in two parts, so it is this comprehensive discussion of um, problems and, and topics uh, uh, that are in tantric uh, studies uh, today and uh, the direction that are being taken by, by scholars, discussing, scholars discussing this um, huge amount of uncertainties. What to, what to include, what to, what to exclude, how to make sense of, of Tantra, and then just this insight into the, the Kamakya temple and the, uh, well, the, the ten Mahavidyas, the, the, the whole holy, holy shrine and the holy mountain that, that you find there. It is based on fieldwork. It's always, always exciting to, to see these, these places that are so charged with legends, with, with memories. With the, with the knowledge of people who, who live there, who, who reside uh, there. And uh, well, you also showed this, well, the esoteric side of Tantra and then the exoteric side, right? It's, it's the temples that are open for, for everybody, the sacrifice that is, that is public, it right? is the, the boys playing there and, and living on, on this uh, hill. So there are just, there are so many aspects of uh, this uh, lecture and the uh, possibility to ask questions, comments, I have, I have a few, but I'm sure that also among the audience are, are some, some questions. Yeah, Madis. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I'm not a specialist at all in, in Tantra, but uh, yeah, it's, it's quite complicated to conceptualize Tantra as we, as we have possibility to see, but uh, I'm right when I say that Tantra has always do with sacred. Or, or is there cases that, that Tantra, whatever it is, or how we call it, can be met in it's everyday life, uh, it's, not, it's not kind of divided, it's not linear, or whatever. it's not kind of sacred or, or, or exclusive teaching or so on. Yeah. As you see, non sex sectors in politics and power in the study of religion. Of course, yeah, this one is um, for me that the study of Asimis Tantra, the Yurman obviously is something that I know extremely well. The secrecy in Tantra exists, but secrecy exists even in uh, Hinduism, non tantric traditions of Hinduism. So uh, we can say that there are uh, some aspects. Tantra related to secrecy, for sure. I'm not so sure that Tantra as a general category. So if we include uh, what, I, what someone calls uh, right hand Tantra and left hand Tantra together, I'm not sure that uh, secrecy is something that you can find in both traditions. Obviously, in uh, Alcor Tantra, uh, tantric traditions related to um, sexual population, visual sexual population, and uh, blood sacrifices usually with <coughs> a uh, level of secrecy. The problem is 
how we can know if there are some level of sins and speak about the contemporary art tradition. How we know if there is some secrecy, is it a secret level of knowledge that a European or a North American white Caucasian cannot teach? We don't know. Mm -hmm. In this way, I am not uh, a fan of initiated when some colleagues on mine are initiated and they told me that they cannot reach some goals that they would like to. So, from textual sources, we know that there is a secrecy because uh, the teaching, the teacher, the guru usually uh, make a oral transmission of knowledge. And the oral transmission usually is not intended at all of a people that speak to other people. This way of course exists. It exists also in normal uh, normal common Hinduism, uh, but can mean also that you have to uh, learn and trees on all, for example, the Kawa medieval Kawa tradition, things that the oral transmission means to drink the, the sexual fruit, the fruits of the goddess. So uh, it is through the ritual that is extremely secret. Only the, the initiated can do this kind of ritual for the textual sources. So drinking uh, sexual fruits, you uh, you reach the gnosis, religious gnosis, <laughs> and it's extremely secret. It is done in uh, this ritual according to the for source, it was done in sanitary grounds or uh, in secret places uh, that we don't know which are. But, so, exists a level of secrecy, but I'm not sure if we can use for all tantra. Well, these are those well, transgressive elements or paths in, in Tantra that are definitely there. On the, on the other hand, there is this well, elements of Tantra that is uh, open or available for, for everybody. I would like to ask the, the question about the concept of Shakti, which is so central in the, in the goddess uh, worship in, in Hinduism, and you, you brought uh, this uh, quotation that connect uh, Shakti not so much with, with feminine power, but with, with the power of, of goddess, that is something that can be manipulated by, by the goddess only. And uh, well, there is this tendency to, to supernaturalize uh, Tantra, but on the other hand, you can also naturalize this or take it, take it uh, down, because in Hinduism, also in Assam, definitely there is this tendency to, to relate each and every woman with, with goddess, that each, each woman, especially your married wife, who is called Shakti, it just it represents the, the goddess. So maybe you would like to comment upon this relationship between this divine Shakti and, uh, and the embodied Shakti. I think that uh, PhD research on Shakti would be a very good uh, <laughs> research because uh, when you read Shakti, usually you think that we are speaking about uh, female power, but if you think uh, on a more philosophical perspective, uh, Shakti is something that the gods give to the goddess to destroy a uh, demon. I don't know if everybody knows the, uh, the legend, but it's something like uh, the gods need to destroy a demon, and they did. but they were not able to do this. Just a woman can do this. However, even if it is the god, the goddess that used the shakti, uh, the, the gods give to the, the, the goddess the shakti. So in my idea, from more extremely, more philosophical perspective and gender, Studies it, uh, it is related with the free sex of gender fluidity. So I'm not so sure that Shakti can be intended only as a 
feminine power. Indeed, uh, act, I put it that because I like that she told that Shakti, Shakti is not a feminine power or energy, but is a power, as she told, that can be managed by the goddess. The, god, the, the gods are not able to manage or manipulate this power. It's something that should be researched more, I think, but maybe not with a, that sort of approach. Sure yes. Well, the distinction between the, the woman and the goddess, it's not uh, so remarkable in, in Hinduism, it seems. And there is also this, the political aspects. So Hugh Gobert has written about this, how the, the kings in Kamarupa, how they manipulated Shakti, or the worshipping goddess Kamakya and, uh, and using it uh, for acting out the, the power in the battlefield. And also the Yuminis uh, that are described in the Tantric text. Uh, sometimes they are, uh, uh, they are women, they are not goddess of all. They are duty, but duty can mean either a wife or, or consort, but it should, she should be also a prostitute. It depends from the tradition. For example, I'm not sure if I'm putting well, but for sure the Kaurajna Nirna, yeah, that is a text of the around 11th for, for the 12th century, maybe later, but there are always a lot of discussion about the tradition of the text. The, 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 the woman in the power ritual, in the sexual ritual, is described as a prostitute. We are sure about this. Uh, why? And this one is a text written in North Eastern Union. Why in the, some other text that later uh, of the maybe pre modern, like uh, 16th century, something like this, late medieval or pre modern text in northeastern India that has some case that share some passages with the Kaurajna Nina, and we can find the same passages. So the people that wrote this. Legal text that was aware about Kalajan Nita, yeah, but at the end, in this text, we can find that the women are uh, described as a uh, demo, that is a male term. So the goddess is described as a god, a tool, as a male god. And it's, it's told that the god, the goddess is a uh, or that she is not Devi at all, but she is Deva, is um, something extremely necessary. It's the most important thing that you have. I think I will speak about this more. And, uh, yeah, well, there are many, many questions, but it's maybe very, very brief. It is also touched upon the, the Buddhist Tantra and the, the Hindu Tantras, like two two schools or two, two paths. It is, could you say a little bit about how they get together or what is, what is common in between them, that is how they di diverge, maybe? I know a lot less Buddhist, Buddhist Tantra, of course. I read something like, for example, the idea is, uh, even if I, I, I do not share enough about uh, its uh, position, but I think that is a very important hour. You have to know the Maya, the Maya if you think that Tantra is uh, uh, originated by the intersection of uh, tribal traditions and Brahmanic and Buddhist traditions. And so, uh, and I respect a lot because I, I really like what he wrote. However, he was an expert of Buddhist Tantrism as Ronald Erickson was an expert of Buddhism that reason. Uh, I, don't, I cannot say too much about Buddhism because uh, it's not my, really my field, but I can say that, for example, coming back to Kamakya, the first text that considered Kamakya as a Shak, as a Pita, Shak Pita means uh, the, the seat, the Pita of the goddess or of the power, that's how you want to translate Shak. The first text that described Kamakya as one of the most important Pita uh, is the Evagya Tantra, that is a Buddhist text. And, uh, 
and there is a great connection between them. Thank you, Buddhism and the, and the birth of Kaula Nutrism. And the, earlier than the Kaula, the India Vita Nutrism, there is a great connection of Tantra Buddhism and India Vita's, India Vita's tradition because they are uh, related to the cremation ground, both in the Tantra Buddhism. There is a, in the early medieval period, I cannot speak about uh, modern time because I think it's wrong, but in the early medieval period, the uh, Tantra Buddhism was uh, related to the crematory grounds. So, uh, the Bodhisattva was in the crematory ground, surrounded by the uh, yogis. That, so they were not at all just Kaula Tantric uh, goddesses, but they, they were also inside the Buddhist tradition, the Vajrayana tradition of Buddhism. There is a great connection in South Asia about, from all the mainstream and non-mainstream traditions. This one is the problem I think to understand the origin of something like Tantra that perhaps we will never understand which one will be which one was the origin. Yeah, Kiki. When we will talk about Tantra, there is some sort of like secrecy around it. It's like hidden, it's very yeah. you know, like word. <coughs> so I was wondering that was uh, when we were researching about it, when we were like conscious about not telling us of the information or not showing us of the text. And how does it fit into the reality? Why do we even really think about it? This is supposed to be like secret text of the certain tradition. And some people come and they reveal this tradition. And they, they reveal or they, they know they don't yeah, know. Yeah. You speak about people today. Like in general, but also considering the ritual specialists or the people that you interact with priests or something. They might be also concerned about the secret knowledge, which is supposed to be secret and passed down on the Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 The devotees. What do you think about uh, I interviewed a, a lot of devotees. I never published my interviews because I, I don't know, I want to use for something else, I think, maybe one day. Uh, during the interviews, I understand that there are many ideas about uh, Tantra. Uh, a lot of the good things, uh, uh, they are aware about the secrecy of the cult. Uh, they, I mean, it's, uh, interviews in a sun, usually in Tamaki, so, or in Uruguay. So it's quite difficult to say that it's. Uh, Something that you can use for a general interpretation of the devotees. But you can say that in Assam the people are quite open. However, when you ask them but about the secrecy, they say, no, there are some things that is secret and you are aware and not silent and you cannot know something. Uh, even the priests of the temple, when you, when you speak with them, they, they tell you a lot of so this one is true and it's Kamaki is a fantastic place because you can go there and you are very welcome to stay there. But it's sure that they cannot tell you everything. So there is a great a, a great of secret, a level of secret, secrecy in Kamakia and in every Arctic Vita. Uh, but not so sure uh, about uh, if there is a great, I think there is a great difference between the secrecy intended by the devotee and the secrecy intended by Brahmanas or priests. That as I use the word priests because it, not all the people uh, are Brahmanas, someone are Kshatriyas, so just for this, I right, use this European word. For me, it's useful <laughs> when you speak about the Tantric tradition. Sometimes we have also non uh, Hindu people that are uh, priests in the Tantric temples. Thank you. Uh, 
well, what is also said about the Kamakya temple is that, uh, well, it closes its doors at the sunset, but the temple wakes up at, at night. And we don't know much what is going on at that night, what kind of rituals are going on. And we are actually we are approaching the, the night, it's dark outside, and we have two more lectures tomorrow and the day after after tomorrow. So maybe we should go out and, and observe what is happening on the yeah, or here in part to the, the souls souls day, souls souls all souls time, night. So I think we we finish here. Thank you all for coming. And tomorrow, and the day after tomorrow, we can listen to you again. Thank you Thanks. very much for coming.